Once you've ruled out the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. And it is not a question of a little occultism or a touch of mysticism, Mr. Denton. It is vampirism, and there's a host of damned souls at Pelham House. Here, the old gods aren't dead. And what of the true god? He's dead. He can't complain. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. You're listening to Paranormal UK Radio. Hi everybody, this is Irene from the Paranormal UK Radio Show, the flagship show on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Whoa, I've got it all out in one breath again. <laughs> now, tonight, Mark is going to host the show because I'm not feeling too good. So I'm going to sit back in the background a bit more and just talk to a guest as and when I have a question, okay? Okay, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that you're not feeling so good tonight. No, no, I'm not Well, between that and the uh, storms that have been pounding uh, oh, the Welsh coast. Britain, the whole of Britain. Oh, my God, that's Storm Kiara. She hit at the weekend. Floods everywhere. We've had snow. We've had sleet. We've had hail. We've had wind. We've had rain. We've had destruction everywhere. And now this week... Uh, We've got another one coming in on Saturday off the Atlantic, and it's Dennis the Menace. Oh, great. <laughs> Storm Dennis, and I think Storm Dennis is bigger than Kiara. She came through, I think, at one point, she was monitored at 97 miles an hour. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, and Dennis, I believe, is bigger than that one. And... Uh, it took Kiara two or three days to pass properly. Good you know? Lord. Uh, do you, we're in for windy days again. Do you normally get these types of storms this time of year? Never used to, Mark. It must oh. be something to do with climate change. It never used to be like this. <laughs> well, I know our guest can definitely talk on that tonight. Uh, that's a oh. good subject for him, which we'll be introducing him in a moment. Um, I just want summers we don't get any proper winters we get sunshine in the winter and we get sun heat in the winter and we get cold in the summer we it's all it's just all jacksy about face that's all i can say well we're having here in north jersey we're having the warmest winter i've ever seen in the 20 years i've been here there's, there's no snow on the ground we've had practically no snow and we've had days going up into the 40s and 50s. Normally, in mid-January, we're in the single digits to below zero, and we've never made it this year. So I've never known you not to have snow out there this time of the year. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, we could still get clobbered at the end of the month going into March. March has been bad some years, but so far, uh, we haven't had anything, and it's very strange. Well, I'll tell you what, it's so cold here, it's... Uh cold enough to freeze the knickers off a monk i tell you <laughs> well, well before we get started you were telling me a story before we came on air and i thought it was uh it would be uh something perfect to share for the show you that you said something happened was it uh, a few days ago uh, it was last week i i can't really explain it i've got no words for it it was three o'clock in the morning i was it was one of those nights i wasn't sleeping properly and I decided that I'd let the dogs out in the garden. So I stood at the back door, looking out over the fields towards the woods, and then there was this horrible blood-curdling noise. It wasn't a fox calling, and it wasn't anything screeching it after being attacked or anything like that. It was the weirdest sound I'd ever heard in my life. And it was literally made my blood run cold. And I just grabbed the dogs and bought them straight indoors and shut the door and locked up quickly because I honestly I'd never heard anything like it it wasn't no I've heard cats fighting I've heard foxes doing mating calls and things like that we've got no big wild animals here and it wasn't an owl or anything it was it was just out of this world 
Could it have I been the, the Welsh Tremor? Well, who knows? Who knows? Well, you <laughs> used to be able to hear those... Yeah, those. Was different. It was, that, this was something I'd never heard before. Hmm. Well, you got to start keeping a, a digital recorder with you, so the next time it, start, it starts happening, you can record it so I can hear it. Yeah, I'm going to have one of them tucked in my nightdress, and I... <laughs> Keep it by the back door. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a good investigator. Yeah, yeah. Three o'clock in the morning, this was, and whether it was a tremor, I don't know. But if it was a tremor, it was making a sound that I'd never, ever heard before. And for the, for our listeners who don't know what the Trey Moore is, that's the Welsh version of the Bigfoot Sasquatch, which has been uh, uh, seen and heard in Irene's area of Wales. Mainly, mainly round Snowden. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, I, I find it very interesting. So yeah, definitely let me know if it happens again. Well, whatever it was, I, like I said, it wasn't of this world, Mark. Mm. Well, between no, I can stand up to a lot of things. I'm not scared of a lot of things, you know. But God, that did worry me. Well, between the ghosts in your house and the UFOs in your valley and the possible train more out in the woods, you know, uh, it all happens around here, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you live in the hot spot of Wales. <laughs> yeah, you can't say Wales is boring, and got the Brecon Beacons not far as well. So you know, there. Are, you, you're going to have a lot of funny things happening, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we go ahead and let's get into the show. Um, really uh, pleased to reintroduce uh, our guest for tonight. He's been on the sh our show a couple of times over the last couple of years. And uh, he's best-selling author, uh, Whitley Strieber, known for his books Communion, his uh, novel War Day, and uh, also co-authored with Art Bell, The uh, Coming Global Superstorm, which they turned into the movie The Day After Tomorrow. And we're here tonight to talk about Whitley. He has a brand new book out called A New World. Whitley, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Hello, Whitley. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Whitley, I'm sorry. <laughs> you sound fine. <laughs> I'm sorry I said about freezing the knickers off a monk. I meant freezing the knickers off a nun. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, who knows what the monks are wearing these days? I didn't want to confuse anyone, so I thought I'd better put that straight. Okay. Well, good thing you straightened that out. That would have confused a lot of people. Yeah, I'll get a complaint for that. <laughs> but <okay. laughs> well, you know, I was... Uh, Oh, you know, what's kind of funny is we, uh, I'll go ahead and mention this. We did try to record this show a couple of weeks ago, and for whatever reason, we had a lot of strange technical difficulties, and we had to reschedule it. And, um, but one of the things I, I mentioned at the beginning of that show, and I wanted to mention it again now that Irene is here, is Whitley, the last time we talked to you, uh, we were talking about your book, The Afterlife Revolution. And uh, we had a very, strange occurrence happened because I know we were talking about your wife Anne and how you had been receiving messages and been in communication with her after she passed and uh, at one point in our last show you were reading reading a story to us and you were doing it very dramatically and uh, when we were all done and we said goodbye to you, Irene and I were talking off the air, and I was commenting on, you know, how dramatic you were reading the stories, like sitting around a campfire reading it. And Irene just said very casually, well, that's just Whitley being Whitley. And it made <laughs> us stop, made me stop my tracks because... She, she that's something she would never ever say because <laughs> she doesn't really know you that well and uh it hit me that uh we felt like ann came through in fact i think we felt like yeah, ann came probably through ann all right yeah it felt like she came through a couple of times during that last show well she does when um we're talking about her her stuff her books she's very close still to me we're very involved with each other i i wear both wedding rings for a reason <laughs> wow you know, I I have to admit I'm a little bit jealous. You know, I've I've lost a, uh, my twin brother, a family member, and I sometimes wish I could have that type of communication. And hasn't happened yet, but 
So, uh, I'm, but I'm really happy for you. And I, I love the book, Afterlife Revolution. I highly recommend for people to pick that up. But now we're going to talk about a new world. And uh, before we do, yes. Also, Whitley, I was talking to Mark this afternoon and I was explaining to him that I can't get wit out of my mind. Every time someone says to me, Who are you having on the show? Oh, it's wit. No, yeah, that's right. She, you say wit, not Whitley. Is that something Anne would ever say? Uh, the only people who call me by nickname are my very close family and my wife. <laughs> Even my son doesn't. I, so I've been calling you wit all week. Even to well, my that's heart. all right. I don't mind. Well, I think this is what's happening again. I think uh, Anne has been coming through and it's been affecting Irene. Because... Uh, my husband said to me the other day, who's the guest on the show this week? And I said, oh, it's Wit. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me. I said, it's Wit. <laughs> That's... I had to explain in the end, you know, a Whitley. And then I explained about your book and one thing or another. But this has happened quite a few times. I've mentioned you as Wit, and I can't understand why I was doing it. Like I said, I, I think it's Anne coming through again. I don't know. Interesting. Well, um, A New World, uh, it, it was just released uh, this last couple of months, and uh, I've had a chance to read it. Uh, fantastic book, and definitely looking forward to discussing it with you. But I was wondering if uh, you could go ahead and <clears throat> kind of introduce how the idea came to you to write it, and you know, what are, we can start talking about some of the key points in the book. Well, it's a... An interesting story because people have to wrap their heads around the fact that it's possible to live in a very different way that from the way we live every day, and it takes an effort. You you have to work at it, but it's possible. And I'm backing up a little bit on purpose here. I'll get to where we. I'll get to a more direct answer to the question in a moment. Back in 2015, after my wife passed away, a few weeks later, I was at a conference. I went to a conference at the Scarrett Bennett Center in Nashville where Ann and I had, and William Henry and his wife Claire, had had a number of conferences, and he was having one, and I just went to sort of connect and feel the, happiness that we'd had there and while I was there a woman walked up to me very nervous and said Mr. Strieber I have something odd just happened I, I've got to tell you she said I just heard Anne's voice in my ear say that to Whit tell Whitley I can see him when he's in the chair and this was a huge moment for me because I meditate in a certain place every night and I realized this particular form of meditation, which is known as the sensing exercise in, in, in the West. It, it was brought into the West by George Gurdjieff, and it's simply a matter of placing your attention, splitting your attention between your thoughts and your physical body and broadening the attention. And I realized it was explained something strange. The visitors, one of the visitors said to me many years ago, back 30 years ago, when I asked them why they had come, and they said, we saw a glow. And I realized it's the glow that occurs when the nervous system, when the attention is added to the nervous system, then you can be seen in other levels of reality. And, and the minute I understood that, of course, the second I came home, I started doing the meditation. I'd always been doing it at 11 at night for 50 years at that point. Then I started to get waked up at three o'clock in the morning. First, someone electrocuted one of my toes um, at 3 a.m. and I, I thought I had gout or something that night. Then the next night, a fingers grabbed one of my nipples and shook it like the Dickens. I leaped out of the bed. It was again exactly 3 a.m. and I realized, no, wait a minute. <laughs> There's nobody in this house except me, and I can't. This is definitely one of these experiences, and I figured maybe they want the meditation, and I did the meditation at three, 
And for the next couple of years, I would be waked up by someone blowing in my face or a light kiss on my lips or blowing on the back of my hand or many other ways uh, at three and do the meditation. And I never saw a soul doing any of this, but it didn't bother me because I've been working with these disincarnate entities and presences so long. I'm just, it doesn't bother me at all. So as this uh, continued, I began to also learn how to use an implant that was placed in my left ear in 1989, in May of 1989, by two people who appeared to me to be military personnel. And they had an extraordinary technology because this thing was placed in the outer part. I'm feeling it now, the pina of my left ear. That's the outer part of it. Right through the skin with no scar, no open wound or anything. Eventually, I tried to have it taken out because it was turning on and making my ear bright red and very hot. And it was really making me quite nervous, as you can imagine. And when I tried to have it removed, it went down into the earlobe on its own, moved through under the skin. The doctor pulled out and Anne said, you shouldn't do this. It's obvious we, we want to leave this in there. And for years, I didn't really, it had no apparent significance. But then after she passed on, it began to work. And what happened was a slit would open up in my right eye like a neat oblong slit and letters like typed letters would race through this at a breakneck speed. You couldn't read them, but they came in subliminally somehow. And I began to try to see if I could make use of them somehow. And I, experimented with using them, but by thinking things I would need in, in research. And then to my amazement, these things would come up in my life in funny ways. And I, I began to actually learn techniques of doing this. I then wrote a historical novel called in Hitler's house which is available under another name, under the name of Jonathan White Lane online. I didn't put it under my own name. It's not a secret that I wrote it. All my fans did. No, but I figured it was so different from everything I normally write. And I wrote it to really learn how to use the implant because I used it for research. And boy, I'm telling you, that novel, it's, it's written from the viewpoint of someone who lived through the war years in the late 30s. And you read the, the, the reviews of it online, and it says it's like somebody went back in time, and that's practically what it was like to use the implant. I could, I could find out the most obscure details about life in those days. So it reads like it was written by somebody who was really there. Okay, that's the practice. Now comes the real stuff. First, afterlife revolution. Then... A new world. And by the time a new world came along, I had learned to use the implant very easily. I knew very much I, I, it works well. And I even learned toward the end of this who was on the other side. And here's the surprise. Two men whom I have known who have been in this thing for many years appeared at my door. Now, these people are not like us. They are human, but they live in the world. And I don't know if you've ever had anyone on the show who talks about a breakaway civilization. Have you? Uh, on your Richard show? Dolan. Uh, who's... Yeah, Richard Dolan. Yes. Yeah. Well, they are from that, I'm convinced. They're very nice. I've known them for years. I've seen them over the past 30 years a number of times. One of them I've known since he was 12. And anyway, they showed up and they explained this thing to me. I was getting ready to have it um, uh, examined because a, a doctor who works with this sort of thing in a, in a, in a, in a, 
uh, a confidential situation, wanted to learn more about it, and I think they were afraid that I would have it removed again. And so they explained it to me. They explained that the words racing past are not from the outside, but from my own mind. And what's happening is subliminal thoughts that are in my own mind and memories that I don't have direct access to are being brought forward. And my conscious mind will pick them up and make use of them. And then they described, they explained who, who had developed this device. It was a man, not an alien, named Constantine Rodeve. And it, I didn't know exactly who that was because he pronounced it Rodive, not Rodeve. And I, I, I was initially not sure. I didn't recognize the name. Let me put it that way. But then I Googled it and I thought, oh my God, he meant Rodeve, Constantine Rodeve, of course. The EVP man who experimented on electronic voice uh, communication with the dead during his lifetime and afterlife was often, was nu in numerous occasions, was picked up from the other side. Apparently, he invented this either on the other side or this side or both. I don't know. But I mentioned it to a few people. And incredibly enough, the only other person I mentioned it to who has the same slit open and the words passing through his, uh, his eye is an expert on Constantine Rodeve. So I concluded that this implant wasn't an alien implant at all. It is a communicator with our own dead. And these young men who are involved in this breakaway civilization somehow are, they live in a life, they live lives where there is no barrier between the living and the dead. They, they are very different from us, and they live right among us, these people. I mean, I don't know where these two people in particular live, but I, I'm sure that there's, that, you know, I'm sure if you, you saw them walking down the street, you wouldn't even think twice about them. And, and so this, I think Richard Dolan's breakaway civilization, it may be somewhere off in space also, but it is certainly right here as well. Now, this... I think will begin to explain why a new world is the way it is. I used the implant as a communications device and a research tool throughout the writing of the book. And the book is, if, if anything, it is a collaboration between me, my wife, and other levels of reality. Let's put it that way. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> uh, you know what? Yeah, there's, there was a lot of there was a lot of development necessary. There, there's a lot in there though that really rings true to me, and I'm and so it, glad and it if, rings true to you. It, it affects me. Well, you know what? I, I know don't, don't ring true to many people. I, I they know, are true. They're, they're quite true. Dolan's idea, and I know Richard. I've met him a few times. A wonderful man and uh, excellent, excellent. Um, very intelligent person. Uh, his idea of the breakaway civilization uh, seemed more like, you know, the the government behind the government, that kind of people controlling what's happening in our world. But it, it what the way you're describing it is feels. I don't know. I, I'm I'm having trouble expressing myself on this one. Uh, it's just it's just hitting me in a certain way that I understand it. Because I just feel like our version of reality, for most of the rest of us out here, what we consider to be reality is just an illusion. We, we only look at the physical world. We're trained from, from birth, basically, to all, in all of our lives, constantly bombarded by people telling us, this is the reality. This is the way it is. Don't question it. Don't, you know... Go go buy your stuff. Go go buy. I right. I, I, I always live, live the physical life. Live this life. You're engaged here to live this life. Right. 
But yet and, there's also so yeah. much more going on around us that it's right here, right in front of our faces that we ignore and we don't really pay attention to. Or, or we've, we've been programmed to not pay attention to it, so we can't see it. And uh, it's been the last few years that uh, my way of thinking of the world and reality has been drastically changing. So, you know, what what you're saying, uh, I do find utterly fascinating, and especially the fact that the implant, um, even though I read the book, for whatever reason, I didn't pick up on the fact that it was uh, a man-made object. Well, man-made or not, I don't know. Man-installed, yes. Yes. Well, now, because I've always sensed that there was someone else in that room. You know, for the folks that don't know the story, uh, what happened was in a, it was a May night in 1989. Now, one of my books, it says 1994, and that's a misprint, by the way, and people always seize on that. So bear that in mind if you've read my books and say, oh, wait, didn't he say 94? Is this all nonsense then? It's not nonsense. It was a typo or a, it was overlooked in copy editing. Anyway, uh, what happened that night was two people, I, I, I was, Annie was, had just fallen asleep. It was about 11 o'clock at night and I was awake. The windows were open because it was a warm evening. We were in our country house in a, 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 a the, it was a big locked gate and it was pretty secure. I thought the, then I heard the crunching of gravel in the driveway, like a, a vehicle approaching quietly and with no lights. Now, this obviously was not good news. That, that, that could not be good. And I started fully awake immediately. I heard at that point a voice in the backyard say, condition red. As I, that was all happening, I was going for the shotgun under my bed. But as I, no, no, excuse me, I, I, was, I then went for the bank of lights beside the bed. There was a bank of switches, which if you turned them on, would flood the entire property in light. I mean, it's not as if I hadn't, you know, I had, had the, I had been trying to get video and stuff of the visitors for years, and I was well prepared. And being a Texan, I was also gunned up, and I am. <laughs> I'm just, I'm very comfortable with weapons, and I, I'm, a, I'm a good shot, and, uh, Anyway, that's neither here nor there. I was the weapons weren't because I was worried about the visitors at all. They were because I was worried about pe people coming up who did not belong there, like was happening that night. I thought, so I went for the shotgun under the bed, and as I was mo uh, after, excuse me, I'm getting a little bit tangled up here. After I went started to turn on the floodlights, as I was moving, I saw two people standing near the foot of the bed: a man and a woman. I then forgot about the lights and went and started to go for the shotgun. The next thing I knew, I was lying on my side. I could not see a thing. It was totally black. I couldn't move a muscle. Someone was pressing down on my left ear, pressing and pressing, pushing my head into the pillow. And the woman's voice was speaking very softly and gently. That ended... There was a flash of light, the sound of someone rushing off through the woods behind the house. I leaped out of bed, grabbed not the shotgun, but the pistol that was in the drawer, and noticed that the alarm was still armed. It was still turned on. So I ran through the house looking for some point of entry. There was none. I got back to bed, and I thought, what the heck? Could there be a lucid dream this lucid? Are you? This is unbelievable. You know, and I knew everything there was to know at that point in time about lucid dreams, hallucinations, seizure-related hallucinations, drug-related everything, because I had been living this now for years, for since 1985, and it was now 1989. And um, so I finally sort of went and slept a kind of uneasy sleep for the rest of the night. I got up in the morning. Every day we used to get the paper. I still do. I'm still old fashioned that way. But in any case, I uh, went downstairs to get, go in the garage 
and to get in my car and get the newspaper. The alarm system at this point still armed. I get into the garage and to my amazement, the garage door is wide open and the alarm system is armed red right there before my eyes on the, on the pad in the garage. So I disarm the system and I get in the car and I find electric static electricity. The car is packed with static electricity, bolts of little mini bolts of lightning are hitting me in the side of the face and everything. I get out of that car pronto because I think, my God, it's going to explode. And I go in the house and I say, Annie, listen, something is wrong. And I tell her what happened the night before, because obviously it did happen. And whoever did it was capable of coming in through that garage door and not tripping the alarm system. So I call the alarm guy. He comes over. He says he ex- ex- examines the thing with a first we try to download the information from the previous night it's all garbled then he examines the door the switches on the door he said Whitley he says Whitley there's a huge magnetic field here it's so powerful that even though the door is open the switches aren't tripping because then he showed me his gauss meter it was just rock slammed all the way over to to the far right. It was absolutely a huge magnetic field. Problem is, these little switches can't sustain a magnetic field like that. And I mean, they're not even electromagnetic. They're mag- just plain magnets. And you can't, you can't create a magnetic field that you can't see out of nothing. It's, you know, they're not, they don't propagate like radio waves. If you're going to create a magnetic field, you need something like a magnet or an electromagnet to do that. And there was nothing there. So he did the only thing he could. He's, he's changed out the switches and it worked fine after that, but we had no idea what had happened. I remembered the people perfectly well. I, I was no, no lapse of memory whatsoever. And then that, that afternoon, my left ear began to hurt. And that was where it started. And now, all these years later, this thing is the most valuable tool I possess. And I think the most valuable thing anyone's ever possessed. And I urge my friend who also has one to learn to use it. And if anyone else has one, learn to use it. Ask it questions and uh, give you an example. Why? I you- asked it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Continue. I asked it when I was writing a new world. I asked it things like, what do I need to know to write the book that I know absolutely nothing about? And what came back was the, the fine structure constant, which was a tremendously valuable to, thing for me to know. I knew nothing about it before that. It led me, the fine structure constant is the is is the most mysterious constant in science. We know how all of the other constants in physics work. We know we know why they are. We know I know why the Planck constant is what it is, and so on and so forth. The fine structure constant is one one thirty seventh, and it's arbitrary. There is no apparent reason for its existence, but it is absolutely consistent. We do know that across the universe. And uh, uh, the discoverer of the fine structure constant was, and I'm, darn it, I'm going to forget his name. Uh, oh, anyway, so much for the implants. It's not helping me now. <laughs> the, um, uh, Wolfgang Pauli considered it the most mysterious thing in science. He became involved with Carl Jung, the psychologist and the psychiatrist and mystic that they became friends over the fine structure constant because Pauli thought that it, there must be some kind of supernatural explanation for it, that it was as if God had arbitrarily decided to do this. And if the fine structure constant was anything different, this whole universe would not work the way it, it does and might not work at all. So it's absolutely essential. It's an essential constant. They all are, but this is, this is extraordinarily essential. 
And from that, I built the whole idea that, uh, it, it, that is in a new world of the ambiguity of reality and the thought that you had that, that people just assume that the physical world is all that's there, I would answer, it's not there at all. Not only that, it's what we see is only what our, and perceive is only what our perceptual systems, our, our touch, our smell, our taste, our eyesight and hearing and so forth, deliver to the brain. We never, ever have any experience whatsoever that is outside of us. And what is out there, well, if you read a book by Max Tegmark about the mathematics of the universe, he shows how underlying everything real all of, when you get down to the most basic forces in nature, underlying and governing those forces is mathematics. They're mathematical formulas. Annie used to say when she was alive, God is a mathematical formula. I used to think that's so naive, but it turns out that some of the most sophisticated physicists and mathematicians in, in, in the world would agree with her that underlying all of this is actually math. And that led to a further insight about the difference between the visitors, the ones who are aliens, look at the world and the way we do. It's not that the two ways of looking at the world are, one is better than the other, but they're very different. They see the world from an input strategy. In other words, they don't see an apple, they see the conditions that 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 actually underlie the apple because th th they don't they don't think that way this is why crop formations are so mysterious it's a it's an attempt on the part of these beings to make things in the physical world that reflect their own minds and the way their minds work the output strategy that we use when you see an apple you it's just an apple and the out world is what it is and we have to because we're big thick beings and we need a lot of sustenance if we're seeing the mathematics behind the apple we're going to be in trouble very quickly because you can't eat math and you may not even be able to figure out it is an apple so <laughs> we use this other strategy and the book among the things the book does is it squares the circle in the sense of showing how the two different strategies can work together. That how we can understand each other, really understand each other. Because people are always channeling them and saying what they say and so forth. They don't talk like us at all. Not at all. They don't think like we do. But they still, we still have a viable point of communication. We can understand each other, I'm convinced. Well, I always felt that that was one of the problems that we as a <clears throat> human race and species have whenever we think of trying to communicate with, uh, whether it be extraterrestrials or even, you know, our animal species here on the planet you know we always we always humanize everything we always put reflections of ourselves onto these these other beings and try thinking that they think the way we would or they would reason the way we would right we and we anthropomorphize everything because we don't know how else to do it mm -hmm. so but if you do that with the visitors forget it you're completely lost Right, and, and it's impossible to really communicate to them. Now, they, now in some of your uh, in your earlier books, when you've talked about some of your encounters, they have communicated with you uh, in ways that sound like English, although whether it was telepathic, I forgot how, how they would well, perceive you. Well, the main one was the first night in, in uh, 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 December of 85 when they had that machine that kept going, what can we do to help you stop screaming? 
don't talk to me with machine would be a start <laughs> uh, because it was a very soft feminine voice, but it was just repeating and repeating. And it was obviously some kind of a machine. And, um, I, it, you know, it, it, I'm, I wonder, I think that they were using it because I don't think they can speak by the way. I don't think they can speak physically. In fact, I'm sure they can't. They don't have that equipment. They, if they're going to speak to you, it has to be in your head. And as soon as that starts to happen, then a disconnect occurs because we are not built to interpret that kind of communication. Our, our brains aren't built that way, nor are theirs built to interpret physical communication. So we don't really know what going on with them i mean i i don't i think they're just a complete enigma i know that from long experience the military has discovered that if you shoot at them they will shoot back and that can be devastating and and, and awful but if you don't then they will begin after a while to teach you and that's what they've done with me i didn't ever shoot back I fortunately didn't shoot back because in in my book, I make reference to a story about a young man who attracted the visitors. This, I mean, the aliens uh, who attracted them with uh, the usual way of shining a laser into the. He saw he had, I'll give you the story more completely. It's this is in the. It's taken from a wonderful book by Kathleen Marden. In any case, he had a private airport. He owned a little private airport. And one night, a flying saucer came and landed at the end of his runway, just as big as life, and then took off again. He ran, after, ran toward it, and it, it took off. And then he began to use different ways of trying to attract their attention again, shining laser lights and putting light, uh, 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 those, uh, fluorescent light bars on the ground and saying, come back and stuff. And they did show up, they came back, but he was not prepared for what then happened because as far as they were concerned, he wanted them in his life, but he was just curious. He was just curious. They, they don't go away. If, if you, if you, if you, open yourself to them, you better expect that to be there for the rest of your life. Cause you could, you just got married, which is in, is my case. I'm, I will never have a time when the visitors aren't in my life anymore. And I don't even want it. They've become an incredibly intimate part of my existence. I would, I can't imagine being without them. in I, any case, the next thing he knew they came, the saucers would come and go. Uh, he got in touch with Kathleen Martin, who is the mutual UFO networks expert on close encounters and abductions. Yes, I know Kathleen. Yeah, you know, Kathleen, and she's a wonderful woman. Uh, and I think, and, uh, anyway, he, uh, one night, one of them showed up, they, sh some of, he found some of them in his hangar. And it scared him. He lived on the place in, in on the airport as well. And then one, and so he got a gun. And one night he woke up and there was one of them standing at the foot of his bed. He shot it. And there was a burst of all this green fluid came out or yellow fluid, I believe, excuse me. And then it disappeared. Then he began to be haunted by this thing, by its it's spirit, I guess. And he basically went mad and died. Hmm. Uh, that's what happened to him. And so when the military sends these young pilots up to shoot at these things, I don't know if they still do it. They sure as hell did it back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s and into the 80s. Uh, and they do this. Then they end up in their houses too, but they don't get told that beforehand that that might happen, that these things might be walking into their kids' bedrooms and not pleased at all with this particular family. Hmm. So 
you know, my my uncle, one of my uncles was in the Roswell incident. He was one of the officers who gathered and cataloged the debris when it was brought to Wright Field in nineteen in July of nineteen forty seven. His commanding officer, Arthur Exon, actually handled the bodies. And so this is, this is not a secret to me at all. None of this is. And I've known pilots that, for various reasons that I don't want to go into. The uh, com- commandant of the Air Force base where uh, the Mantell incident occurred was sort of semi-under guard in the uh, a street away from me when I was growing up and his I grew up with his kids. Uh, his name was Colonel Guy Hicks and he had been cashiered because of this incident where Mantell had flown up after a UFO and it had it had uh, damaged his plane and killed him and the plane had crashed and the Air Force had put it about that it was a weather balloon then sealed the coffin even from the family and buried the guy. And it was no weather balloon. And Colonel Hicks knew perfectly well what had happened, which, he, which is why he was in this particular place being monitored by the FBI. And we don't need to go into any detail about why my family was there too, but it was. And uh, so all of this stuff happens. It's real. It's very real. And unlike us, they don't have a barrier between the living and the dead. And when they don't have bodies, they are just as able to function in this reality as they would when they had a body. But if you deprive them of a body like like that poor fellow did, then there are going to be consequences because you've taken something from them that was valuable to them. And so, you know, the, the moral is we shouldn't be shooting we should be trying to figure out how to communicate and we have not done that at all at the official level we're still basically shaking our spears at them like a bunch of people in the in the stone age shaking their spears at a passing in a stone age tribes shaking their spears at a passing airplane well you you know we're still doing that to each other right now I mean, <laughs> considering oh, yeah. everyone's shaking their spirit, everybody else at this point in time. And uh, it's you, th- there's one line you, that's part of the, the reason why you you called the book what you did. And you had mentioned it in previous books about uh, Colonel Philip Corso. And he asked them along when he was interacting with them he says what's in it for us and their answer was a new world if we can take it if you can take it yeah and and it means all of that it means if you can wrest it out of their hands if you can understand it if you can bear it because bearing it is the hard part um we have egos and it takes years and years of working with the visitors to get to a point where you can be with them without feeling a sense of ego death that is the most frightening thing you can imagine. I mean, I lived with this for a long time. I'll give you an example, which is from A New World. My co-author of Supernatural, Jeff Kripal, is a Jeff is a uh, professor of in fact, the dean of the Department of Religious Studies at Rice University in Texas. It's a very prominent American university. In any case, he was with me in uh, at the Esalen Institute on the California coast, which is a very famous place uh, uh, where a lot of sort of counterculture and new age things have been developed and happened there. And I was at a conference there um, with Jeff and we were sleeping in the same room together. And I, the visitors were coming at that point in my life every night at three to wake me up. And I said, Jeff, it's going to happen tonight. And he said, Oh, I'm so excited. I want to be, I want to, I want to be in the room when it happens. I said, okay. And I said, but I warn you, it isn't easy. And they came, one of them came, 
and it came in the window. The room was right overlooking the Pacific, and I knew they would come there physically because, you know, when they have a big body of water, they can leave quickly and safely, and there's a lot of ca- they take a lot of care with themselves. So it was an ideal chance for a physical bit of a, a bit of engagement, and he blew on my. I was sleeping with my head to the right and the window was right on my right a few feet from the bed he blew on my left hand to wake me up so that I only glimpsed his face for a moment and I had this experience of this implosion of self but I'm used to it and you know and so I I turned my head away and we meditated the two of us together for a while because I do many nights and this time I could sometimes couldn't see him anymore, but I had seen him at least at first, which was nice. And I went back to sleep. He then approached Jeff about an hour later. And Jeff is not, not experienced in this. And he had this devastating sense of, of inner destruction. Uh, and the sound of, I believe he said it was the sound of something crashing and breaking all around him which was the sound of his, his inner self being shattered by this egoless, immensely conscious presence that is completely cognizant of both living and dying and being alive and dead at the same time. We are not like that. We are living beings and clinging to life. And Jeff heard a voice from within himself say, oh my God. And that was his inner self saying that I could die more deeply right now, even than the death of the body. And this is why it is so frightening and so hard to be with the visitors. And this is a big part of if you can take it. Wow. With, with that, um, if we go off the release, the the way I, I believe, you know, people have their religious beliefs and, or spiritual beliefs. And I, you know, and Irene and I have had many, many long conversations about the, um, what we call, you know, the, the super conscious or the, uh, higher self, the um Irene, what what would we call that? Do you remember when we were talking about the mind? Be- I don't know if she can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. I can't remember what we called it. I really can't. That was about that particular conversation was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Yes. <clears throat> and and really you know, very deep conversation. With us inhabiting these physical bodies, yet we still have this mind consciousness. I liken it to, like, you know, in in Christianity, they talk about uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Um, And I've always likened it to, to a version of mind, body, spirit. Actually, it's more like mind, spirit, body. You have the body, the physical, living uh, physical meat suit that we walk around in when we're inhabiting this realm, but then there's this the spirit or the soul aspect of it that that experiences these lifetimes and or in multiple lifetimes, multiple dimensions. But above all that is the mind, and the mind is part of that God consciousness or part of that all. And so I'm trying to. You learn well, Grasshopper. <laughs> Trying to go off what you're seeing, Whitley, about losing that ego, losing the, the, that human part of the ego. Um, is it? Is there any correlation between what we're experiencing now and what is possible with connecting, either through meditation or through other practices, of connecting with that higher self or the, that mind? aspect oh yeah that's the whole practice that's the whole way in the in 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 my life and in the book in uh, new world Um, we think the way we are 
most of us every day. We are our name. In other words, you were given a name at birth. And now you are that name. You are that person. You are, I am Whitley. I am Joe is Joe. Mary is Mary. But that is not true. And the journey beyond that is the journey of the soul in life and also the journey that it's necessary to take to come to a point where you are comfortable with living in the larger reality that the visitors and our own dead inhabit. And here's where it goes. With practice, you begin to see that the self that you identify with is not all of you. That in fact, that this is the whole physical structure is a kind of mechanism that is inserted into the, the, into the world of entropy so that you can experience change. You're not, that's not you. Whitley is not me. I am behind Whitley. Whitley is an instrument that I use to experience change and to be affected by the energies of change. Now, beyond that, there is another level where the, you begin to see the body in terms much more of what it really is, which is not a thing at all, but rather a field of concentrated energy that is slowed, essentially slowed down. And you begin to see it from, in a sense, from the outside and the inside at the same time, because I can assure you, this is not like schizophrenic dissociation. It is becoming really intimate with yourself, much more intimate with yourself than you are when you're living in the illusion that you're just your name, much more than that. And then you learn a technique, which is a, a, a very simple process of words, which over the years, if you use it enough, gradually will lead you on a path that, or, or will rather open a path within you to a greater vision of yourself. And that is simply the sentence, I am no thing. Not I am nothing. I am no thing. And gradually, the real being behind the body, behind the name, the one who is using this experience to gain energy will become you. And you will cease to be completely identified with the body and become much more conscious in a larger way. This is the journey. And it's an ancient journey. You can see it described in every single great religious tradition. I'm just describing it in a demythologized way for the modern mind. You know, <laughs> it's funny, I... I, I typed Irene offline that this conversation for whatever reason is almost putting me in a semi trance state. I mean I feel like I'm <laughs> I hope it's not sleep. No, not sleep. I, I'm here I'm following you. I'm with you here, but I'm I feel like a change I I feel a change in my body and my energy while we're having this conversation. Well, um yeah, because uh, of the fact that the fact if you live like I do your voice your voice has a different energy. <laughs> the and and going along with what you were, you were saying earlier, um, there was a line in Afterlife Revolution that's always really stuck with me, is at one point when you were having communication with Anne, and I think you asked her something along the lines of, are you still Anne? And her response was, no but I'll be Anne for you. Yes, she said, I am not Anne anymore, but I will always be Anne for you. 
And I have gotten to the point where I am, I am very comfortable with the soul that projected Anne and others. One soul might have more than one body in the world at the same time. Um, and I am, that soul is very much my, my, my partner and companion. And I remember the time of Anne's body very, very fondly, but that body is dead. And the ego that was called itself Anne is dead too. The ego is part of biology. It doesn't survive. And, and that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. My relationship with the soul is so intimate and so deep and so, I guess the word is just happy. It's, it's wonderfully happy. It's a wonderfully happy relationship. And laughter is still a big part of it, just as it was when Annie was physically alive. We're always laughing about each, at each other. Um, and when I leave this body... And we have right now. We think of ourselves as one, two, two consciousnesses with one body. We share the body, and so that's why I wear both rings. I probably said that before. I say it too much. I know that, but in any case, this is what we are now. We have one body left in the physical, and we're both using it for the same reason. I I go to things that I that she wants to see, like. Uh, she wanted to see the animated Oscar shorts the other day, and I went and made sure that I was out of the way. In other words, my ego was not turned on, and she used my body for the, to watch the shorts because she was very interested in animation. And she can do a lot of things, and she can do anything she wants to with this body as long as she can, she can get my attention, bang on a can loud enough to do that, which is sometimes hard. But in any case, that's how we live. And that's a way of, you know, when the barrier between the living and the dead, when that illusion, when mankind finally reaches a point where that illusion is no longer necessary, everyone will live like this. And there's no death. It doesn't even mean anything. It's just, a, you know, you, you finish a body and, and she's already got another one going that, that in this world uh, that I know very well. It's a little baby now that will be a projection of the same soul. You maybe I'll even know it, and maybe I'll after after I give up this body, after it winds down, I'll project another one, and we'll do another another time together. I, possibly, I don't. I don't know. Well, if you haven't already, and that was something I was going to touch on, the fact that the idea of living multiple lifetimes, the, the our soul, spirit mind, whatever you want to call it, living multiple lifetimes simultaneously, <clears throat> which, again, people start getting away from the idea of linear time, where all time is really happening at once and all these different dimensions. I, I liken, I liken the, the soul or the, the, the mind to like an octopus with multiple tentacles, all each reaching out in different directions, and each one is going in and, and experiencing a lifetime or different types of experiences, all happening at once, all being downloaded into that central mind. So for what you said with uh, Anne already being back in a in a body here now and is a baby and going to grow up and live another lifetime but who's to say also that there isn't a part of you that's also doing that as well i i remember in in and i forget which one of your earlier books that you had mentioned about during your meditation um experiences being able to witness or see yourself in multiple lifetime I, I mean multiple alternative lifetimes happen, ha happening simultaneously with now do you, uh, do you remember which I'm to what I'm talking about uh yeah yeah 
So again, is it is it something like that too? Again, that soul is living not only you know you and maybe other different versions of you in multiple realities and maybe even different people completely all together at the same time. Yeah, I don't see why not. I think that uh, these souls are immensely complex beings, and I think many of them. Uh, I would assume do that. I know that my the one that projected Annie into the world does does and did, and I'm the one that is me that projected Whitley is is me, and I have found that determining who the other projections are is very difficult for me because I'm, I am not complete. I, I am that soul, but at the same time, I am also the projection and the borders between them are very important because it, it, there is a something, there is a desire to experience novelty and if there's too much connection between them, then there's going to be a reduction in the level of spontaneity that each one experiences. And this is what we're here for. We are here to generate spontaneous experiences that are then gathered behind, kind of back behind us in parts of us that larger parts of us that we cannot directly see and so i would say that the soul that is also me has many projections in the world and i think that we all do but to be able to connect them that's hard it's because it's not actually wanted you know and you you can't you can't do something that your own soul does not want done, I don't think. And well, why would you want to? It, it just it would screw you up, I'm sure. Otherwise it would be something that we would do ordinarily. Well, and again, there's a lot of programming and conditioning that we've experienced all of our lives and, and in so many different ways we have to be deprogrammed, retrain, relearn. Um I, I read Tarot and you know, the one card that people who aren't as familiar with with tarot, they fear is the death card. And because they think, oh, my God, I mean, somebody's going to die. It's a, but, you know, it's it's signifying change. In fact, it is is the death of one. You could look at it as the death of one way of thinking and a new way of thinking comes or one aspect of your life dies but then it moves but then it's opening the door for something new to come in so it's not a death but it is change and for us at this moment in time it feels like we're going through some drastic change which it feels like the human race is being dragged along kicking and screaming and <laughs> uh but it feels like we could be on the verge of breaking some of those old bonds and being able to move forward ever so slightly beyond the training and start to look at the world as it really is, starting to experience these other realities, not just with other dimensions, not just with our own dead, but with these other entities who come in and out of our reality, uh, the visitors or whatever else these beings may be. And, you know, you, you had mentioned that the, the visitors, that they, that they need us almost as much as we need them. Uh, I was wondering if you could clarify that a little bit. What is it that they would really need from us? I think that they need spontaneity because I think that they are outside of time looking in and we are inside time. And if you, you know, they, whoever is here comes to me really wants to make entry into me. And that is why the sensing exercise, when I do it, 
it seems to me that that someone participates in my life experience when I do that. And I believe that they hunger for the spontaneity of our lives. Because if you're looking at the time stream from the outside, you can't have that. You can't be surprised. And, you know, there was a, an article written years ago. I actually have it in a copy of it in my hand right now by T.B.H. Kuiper and Michael Mark Morris, two physicists. Um, and in the magazine Science, in volume 196 in uh, 1977, called Searching for Extraterrestrial Civilizations. And they concluded that anyone who came here would be very secretive. They would hide themselves. Because the moment they revealed themselves, our entire civilization would cease its own spontaneous journey and turn toward them, thus, thus neutralizing our, our own journey. And they wouldn't have any reason to be here except to observe us in our journey. And I think this is the, exactly the truth. I have thought that maybe Kuiper and or Morris were, were aware of what was actually going on behind the scenes because there was lots of people, physicists and people from JPL, who were working on this behind the scenes at the time and publishing publicly as well. And uh, it might be that they knew for sure that this was the case. In any case, it's a very insightful paper, and I think it's the reason that the visitors are so secretive and it's the reason that, and and they they need that spontaneity because if you know essentially everything, what is there left? You know, to 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 them, the universe is all. There's no adventure; it's all known to them. And especially if I'm right about them being outside of time, then they may know its future as well, at least in broad outlines. So they would be. It would be a kind of claustrophobia of inf in infinity. But then here we come, and our entire vision of the universe is it's a great huge mystery. And when we think of, of, of leaving our planet, we think of Star Trek and things like that. We're full of excitement and adventure. We're the children. They're the old, you, the old adults who have done it all. And if they can spend just a little time with us, I think it is a great relief for them. When they choose to work with somebody, uh, I mean, I'm trying to understand, and I may not ever understand, I don't know if you can explain it, um, the, their, their process for working with specific people. Uh, or at least specific people, at least remembering or having you know memories of dealing with them. And I don't know if it happens to all of us at some point, or if it's just you know certain people who are affected by it. And do you ever have an understanding of why they choose to work with uh, those people? Uh, I think that it's a matter of who will turn toward them and who won't, and. Uh, basically in my case, they were with me as a child and I had a wonderful time with them when I was a child. They were the most, very most precious thing in my life. But I understood from an early age that I had to keep them very much secret and I did. And then I tried to introduce my father to them and it, he, he was so terrified that it's, I became frightened of them too, and when I was twelve, they left my life, and I was—it was devastating. I had a horrible teenage struggle as a result of it, in part as a result of it. Then forgot about it altogether, went to college, and lived my life, and then came in 1970 to the Gurdjieff Foundation, and without knowing it, began doing this sensing exercise. And signaling them whenever I did it. Fifteen years later, 
I guess they finally became convinced that I was serious and showed up. By this time, I didn't remember a thing about them. They scared the living, living daylights out of me. But then I thought, oh, my, I mean, they were frightening and they beat me up good. But at the same time, they're real. They're real. This is the most amazing thing I've ever known. And I turned toward them. I started going out in the woods in the middle of the night trying to connect with them. Just like the guy that Kathleen Martin had that tra ha case, had that tragic experience. He tried to connect with them, but he didn't understand that it was going to be on their terms, not on his. I did understand that. I understood it from the beginning that it would be on their terms because I had already been with them and I knew how powerful they were. And therefore I figured, you know, if they deign to come back, I better just be ready for whatever they have to dish out because I'm not going to be the one making the decisions here. And you know, that basically formed this teacher student relationship that's existing in my life. Now I expect them to be teachers and I expect, to be led and guided and told what they want me to do. I don't expect to try to make the decisions myself. I expect, for example, that I will continue to wake up and do the meditation at three o'clock in the morning until the day I die. They don't say, show any sign of ending it. In fact, they don't blow on my, they don't wake me up every night anymore. But if I don't do it for three or four nights, then yeah, they, they will wake me up to do it. And so that's my life now. I, that is part of my life. I have them in my life all the time there. I have no time when I would say that I'm private from them. If I want to cut up in some peculiar way, which fortunately I do not, I would have to do that when full knowledge that they were there. You know, so I, if you, I mean, if you want to live like that, then, then yeah, people don't want to live like that. They want to live as individuals. I don't live as an individual. And now I live as part of something larger. Now I, I, in reading your books and I've read most of your books, uh, discussing uh, your experiences with the visitors. I know that a lot of the lessons that they were putting you through were very, very hard. In fact, uh, they're, they're not very sympathetic. They, um, they're, they're tough teachers. They're tough teachers, but they're very tough, you know, but you know, sometimes you have to be tough in order to really get the point across and to learn. Um, the, uh, and I'm, I'm asking, I'm going to ask you something that's a little off track just because, uh, Irene had, had mentioned that she had an experience when she was a child. She has a memory of being in a cavern underground and she saw what she thought were, like these troll-like figures. Uh, she was hiding behind a rock and a rock wall that jutted out. And she saw, as, as a, she says, as a child, she saw them as part of what she needed. And But as a part of her got older, she tried to cut them out of her life. And she found them annoying, but still really can't get rid of them out of that mind. It's kind of haunted her. And which which uh, makes me ask you know we talk about the visitors but then you also mentioned in the book the other types of entities and creatures and people talking about mythology going back you know for thousands of years everything you know are the are they related to what we would consider to be like you know the elves and leprechauns and and gnomes and trolls or whatever that yeah. have been a part of our constant folklore is really part of who these these beings really are Absolutely, they are. They certainly are. Uh, the fairy lore and the fairy faith of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, rep that those are the visitors of the aliens of the 20th century and 21st century. It's the same beings. And she saw what she saw underground were the beings I call the kobolds, who have been part of my life all of my life. They were the ones who were with me when I was a child. And I think that they are human, and I think that they are in, involved in the uh, movement of, of the, it, it, when a person dies, 
I think that they have something to do with the re placement of that of, of, of that of that entity into another body. And and um I'll tell you why I think they are human. Our secretary, Annie's secretary, was a lady named Laurie Barnes. Lovely, lovely, lovely woman. She she came to us in this way and and was reading these letters we would get back in the back in eighty seven, eighty eight. And huge bags would come in from the post office, just gigantic bags. This is before email. And uh, uh, all the letters have been collected, by the way, in the Whitley and Ann Strieber archive, speaking of universities, is at Rice University, which has been very good to me. In any case, uh, she was reading these letters, and sh she said, you know, Whitley, I need a secretary. I need somebody to help me with this. And I thought, well, I said, we'll call Manpower and get somebody over here. And she said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'll find the person in the letters. I thought, in the letters? Come on. A few minutes, literally five minutes later, she opens the letter and she says, here's the secretary. She ho hands me the letter and I look at it and it's about, it's from this woman that's a singer and a, she says she's a singer and an actress and I said, well, she says she's a singer and an actress here. He hand says, you ever heard of her? I said, no, I've never heard of her. I said, look at her handwriting. And it was so beautiful. She had a lovely penmanship. I said, well, yeah. She said, that's the handwriting of someone who knows an awful lot about handwriting. That person has secretarial skills, believe me. She's been taught that handwriting. That's not something that you just get out of school. And so she called her up. And she turned out to live half a block from us in Manhattan. And I hear her say, Annie say, oh, good. So you're not working now. Great. Well, why don't you come over and start work right now? Ten minutes later, she had a secretary who was with us for 15 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, here is when, here is why, here's what was in Lori's letter. She described being a young woman pregnant with her first child back in the 50s, before any of this was known at all. She was lying in bed late at night. Her husband was out on a pianist and he was out on a gig. She was lying there in bed, reading. She was pregnant, about six or seven months pregnant, quite pregnant. And she noticed movement out of the corner of her eye and she looked up and this line of dark blue figures, troll-like figures, just like you were just describing, were standing beside the bed. And she was appalled because, you know, there was no idea of aliens or anything like that in the world in 1956 when this happened. I mean, yeah, there were movies and things, but that, let's put it this way. The idea that that could come into your house and your bedroom was not part of our thinking. And she recoiled. And the leader said, perhaps physically or perhaps in her head, she didn't know. My dear, do not fear us. Uh, no, no. He said, do, you, do not be afraid. We are not here for you. We're interested in the girl child you're carrying. <laughs> oh, I bet that which, went over well. <laughs> which really reassured her. I mean, she said, and, and so then she said, oh, fine, no problem. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> she was horrified beyond belief. And she was panicking, and it lays its glove, dark blue gloved hand on her hand and says... Why do you fear us so much? And this is the key point. She said, because you're so ugly. And he said, my dear, one day you will look just like us. And I think we were looking there at the level of humanity that manages the movement of souls between bodies. Hmm. Do you? I think that's what they are. I think that's who it is who lives in those caves. Listen, I've been 
being involved with them in caves all my life. They, when, when I was a boy at our country house, there was place where in the, it was in the, in the brush in the hill country in north of San Antonio, Texas. There was a place, a little draw you could walk into where they come out after you and take you in. Me, anyway. Uh, and uh, I would go down in there for, this perp- for that purpose. And I don't remember much about it, except that I did it. And, you know, I'm here to, to basically to bring a message that we're going to become conscious of ourselves as a species in a new way. That's another level of what the new world is about. That is really fascinating. The, these, ty- these beings, uh, well, between, between the cobalts and uh, the greys, I guess, uh, or those types of beings that you, visitors that you have dealt with, uh, how many different types would you say that you've had encounters with? I, th- I think you mentioned three. Uh, yeah, I've had encounters with first the kobolds, the greys. I've been, had encounters with human beings who are working with in this level. I've had encounters with what I think was a hybrid and two men who were, I don't know what they were. And with the blonde people, the big, tall blonde people, I've had a number of encounters with them as well. And of, um, um, so that's what I've had. I may have seen a reptilian being one time, but I'm not sure. Uh, I've never seen a sort of reptile in a business, business, business suit or anything like that. Anything like that. I, the ones that I've seen, that the only ones that are really uh, disturbing looking are the kobolds. The others are, you get used to them very quickly. Do, do the kobolds the, uh, have hoods? Do they wear hooded clothing? Yeah, they do. They do. Okay. Interesting. The um, <clears throat> There are a lot of people who have had experiences with, you know, a lot of abductees or experiencers uh, who've, ex- who've been having these similar experiences. It, there's, a, there's a feeling amongst uh, researchers that there are multiple races here all looking at pursuing multiple agendas, uh, some beneficial to us, some like they could care less about us, and some even um, hostile towards us. That, do you feel that is the case, or do you feel like what we're dealing with, especially the entities that you're dealing with, uh, are what we're primarily interacting with? We have to learn how to see this without looking in a mirror. And when you do, you find that all of that stuff, it just forget it. I mean, we don't know. Nobody knows. You can get people on your show that have elaborate descriptions of this species and that species. And, you know, I always think to myself, I listen to this stuff and I think, you know, what if the human species was a star traveling species and we went to another planet what would they think well if we could travel freely there they would encounter heartless scientists who would treat them like lab animals they would encounter religious people who would have a different vision of them they would encounter criminals who would exploit them They might encounter insane people who might do very bizarre things to them. In other words, from this species alone, they would encounter a whole huge array of different reactions and responses. And if we are dealing with more than one species, there is going to be a vast array of... uh, of things, a vast array of things that that they may be doing and needing and wanting. Some of them I know, or I know this, 
that all of them are united in one respect. They do want this species to survive. And anyone who tells you different is, 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 is talking through their hat because that is absolutely universal in this because no one, first of all, no one's going to be able to take, going to take, take, want to take the planet. If someone wanted to invade and do that, they would have done it years ago and it would have taken a matter of seconds. And when I say years ago, I'm talking about thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years ago, this would not be a human planet, but it is a human planet. Therefore that didn't happen. And even if they showed up here 50 years ago or 30 years ago or 10 years ago, they could have certainly done that easily. And they didn't. And they don't. In all of my life with them, and it is all of my life, I have had an immensely challenging but deeply supportive experience. It has never been anything else. And it has been hard and harsh. When I was received that initiatory experience in 1985, it was like an attack. It was, it was an attack. It was a physical assault. But my reaction to it was that it opened my mind to new possibilities and therefore for me became initiatory, initiating me into a new level of reality and a new vision of reality. If you, if, and many people, when it happened, that didn't happen to them. They just got frightened and either pushed it into their subconscious or remembered it in anger and fear. And there are plenty of people like me, though, who went out and tried to make something of it. And if you do that, it changes. It doesn't get any easier necessarily, but it does certainly get interesting. That's for sure. Well, when we deal with our culture and 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 and, and I, I chuckle a little bit when you said this is a a human world or a human planet which i wonder if that's actually true because i think we are sharing this planet with a lot of different types of uh intelligences that uh we're just not quite aware of and who have been here probably longer than we have um well there are a lot more of us that i do know Maybe, maybe, in, maybe if they were all visible, it would be turn out to be there are more of them, but they don't physically exploit the planet like we do. That we do know. No, no, we are the planet's worst enemy right now. And, and even with what you had to endure when you first came out with communion and the ridicule and the snickers and the jokes and, you know, the, the how the human... Western society, especially, just is not was not ready to hear this kind of story. Now we're in, coming into the 21st century. It's a lot becoming a lot more accepted. You have your shows like Ancient Aliens, which has been on what now ten years now. I'm I'm shocked that show has lasted as long as it did. Although, um, and I know you've done a few episodes of it in this last year or so. What the, show is Ancient I mean, Aliens? Oh yes, that's right. I have done a few episodes of it. And, you know, I, I like, they seem to struggle there for a while on how they were going to continue it. And now they've got a new angle, which is, I think you've been part of those episodes, which I, I've really been enjoying. It seems more refreshing. But it's much more in our consciousness now. It's much more accepted by by people in, and I say Western societies because there's so many Aboriginal cultures, even Native American cultures, you know, the, the Australian Aboriginal cultures who have uh, been accepting of these, of these people and these beings for, for centuries. So it's only Western culture where we've been so focused on, on uh, science, let's say, what we can put right in front of us, put under a microscope, um, last week we, uh, we interviewed, uh, John Edmonds. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He owns this, the Stardust Ranch down in Arizona where he's had a lot of experiences and his co-author Bruce McDonald. And, uh, they brought up something really interesting where coming into the 1800s and the early 1900s, you know, you had the age of, in the Victorian age, you had the age of spiritualism coming in, so coming from a very religious age into an age of spiritualism. But when the Industrial Revolution hit, it seemed we turned away as a society from all of that and like looked at science as our new 
master, our new religion. If we couldn't, again, put it in front of us, examine it, you know, put it under a microscope, then it didn't really exist. And so we've we've become a society that has turned away. Now people are still can still be religious or call themselves religious, but when it comes down to um, our media and our our governments and whatnot, they still turn to the scientific side, not wanting to acknowledge these this other existence that that is right there. It's we're living right in the middle of it. And this is where I feel like some we've been conditioned since childhood, going to school, learning elementary science, learning, okay, this is the way the world is. It makes me wonder if we lived in a more of a culture and a society that was more accepting and open to that, how much more advanced we could become in, in, in moving forward uh, as they're trying to bring us forward right now. And I apologize. I'm I'm having a really hard time tonight putting words together uh, uh, and expressing myself. But do do you have an understanding of what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, in the my show, um, Dreamland, uh, uh, on I had a year end show, which is a special always across the two weeks of Christmas and New Year's in which I interviewed two scientists, one, Ed Belbruno, and Dr. Belbruno is a, a professor of mathematics and at Princeton and the recipient of the Humboldt Prize, the very prestigious German scientific prize in 2018, and earlier was... Uh, named by the New Scientist magazine as one of the 10 most important space scientists in the world. It wasn't always that way. Back in 1996, he was uh, writing in a... He was just about to be fired by NASA because he was failing in a, 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 a very important task of saving a satellite that had been... that had been... Um, uh, uh, its orbit was deteriorating and they were trying to figure out the math necessary to move it to just the right position so it would continue to to go to, to orbit the earth and his his solutions weren't working he had a, an experience and he in the I believe he was in, on a road in the dark night of in Wyoming in this big square thing ended up hanging in front of him and it, it, his car and his, he and his girlfriend were in it and they had to stop because this thing was in, it was dark, but they could see it in the car lights. They didn't know what it was. It was hanging above the road and he, it, it was just there for a few minutes and it went away and they continued on. But then calculations started coming into his head and he saved the satellite and became one of the great one of the people most responsible for the transformation of the whole science of orbital dynamics and he says on the show that he thinks that that experience played a part in the, in his under, in his insight into these calculations um, the other one who was on was a man named Deep Prasad, who is an artificial intelligence expert, who last November was sitting in his office working and suddenly found a bunch of little grays just walking around in his office. And, of course, it blew his mind uh, because, you know, things like that aren't supposed to exist. And it is changing. I, he did not have a – he did not have a direct – um, change in his thinking that he's aware of as yet, but it certainly changed his worldview tremendously. And as I say always, they want us to survive for their own reasons, obviously. I mean, you know, we want our cattle to survive, but it's not necessarily because we think they're, we think they deserve life. It's because we want to eat them. And the visitors want us to survive, but it's not necessarily 
because they're all sweetness and light. In my book, there's lots of dark stuff. It's a it's just a very complex experience, and not all of it is to our liking. Believe you me. Um, but these things happen like this, and I also know people who I can't speak about directly because they've asked me to keep their names confidential. I mean, I'm not a UFO in, uh, insider or anything like that. I don't even know if that exists. Or it does exist. I, mean, I do know that. I don't want to be, uh, don't know, dissemble here. But uh, in any case, I know other people who have had encounters with the visitors that have been very helpful to their scientific work as well. Now, we, we talked earlier about the break the idea of the breakaway civilization and that humans working alongside of the visitors the ones that put the implant in your ear uh, but i've also heard stories of more the people talked about more negative side of a breakaway civilization and i'm curious in your perspective is there more than one or are there is are there civilizations that have competing agendas and the reason i bring that up is when people talk about they have they see they have an encounter and then they have an encounter with the men in black or the government officials or people warning them to shut up and not talk about what they've experienced or certain types of harassment that some people uh who've experienced something will get to be quiet and is that you know some of sometimes these people tend to ex, uh, ex, exhibit certain types of what we would almost call paranormal aspects to them that make it seem like they're not exactly human or not exactly in our world like we are the regular people so again i'm asking from your perspective do you, do you feel that there are competing people out there with competing agendas working in these uh, types of realities or is it something that maybe that we're misunderstanding? Uh, I can't say that I know the answer to that question. Certainly. Uh, the, it isn't that we are necessarily misunderstanding, but we, we, we don't have enough information to understand in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've had that, for example, um, when we were living in the country in upstate New York, toward the end of the time there, th things got uh, quite hairy in that lots of local people who would work at the house and so forth would see the visitors in the woods and stuff, and they carried tales back into the community, and a level of hostility built up toward me that was really a little scary. And all of a sudden this man he first i thought he was a boy i was walking in the woods one afternoon and it was a hot august afternoon and um there are pit were pitch pines up on the ridge just be above the house and these pines are called pitch pines because they have a lot of pitch in them and they'll they're just explosive when they're dry if you light a pitch pine on fire it, it'll practically blow up in your face but there sat under a tree not one of the pitch pines but near the pitch pines a boy smoking a cigarette and he was um you know the tree there was a lot of dry grass around it was a very dangerous place to be smoking a cigarette and so i walked over to him and i started to tell him that he shouldn't smoke there and i leaned forward and I realized this was not a boy. This was something else. He was the size of a boy, and he had the features sort of of a boy, but they were, he looked old, as if, can you, if you can imagine someone who matured to the age of 11 and then just didn't mature any more than that, but got older and older and older. That's what he kind of looked like. And he, it scared me. It scared me badly. And when he wouldn't respond in any way, I turned around and went back to the house. And he smoked constantly. He never stopped smoking. And we would, 
it, on still mornings, the cigarette smoke would float over in, into the house from the woods. And it was very disturbing to have him out there. You can imagine. And one afternoon, Annie and I went skinny dipping. And he started running back and forth in the woods behind the pool where you couldn't see into those woods because it was too too thick. And um, breaking sticks and gasping and making a great ruckus. And so we went inside and Anne said, I think he's guarding us. I think he's guarding us. I think he's, I think we're in danger here. In any case, didn't much matter because the next October, a few months later, we lost the cabin. It, financially, we, we were ruined. We, people stopped, you know, I started getting laughed at a lot on the television and so forth. And people will buy books from someone who's controversial, not from someone who's being laughed at. So they, you know, they don't want to walk up to a, bookstore clerk and say, I want this book, uh, and the, see the clerk snicker at them. So in those days it was all, there was no internet sales. So I was pretty much ruined and we lost the cabin. We left. We were now living in a little condo in San Antonio, Texas. And darned if he doesn't show up there, he it ends up standing right outside the bedroom at night smoking cigarette after cigarette and you can see the cigarette smoke filters into the bedroom. There's a little cul-de-sac and beside it, a screened in porch. And then the bedroom opens out onto the screened in porch and he was in the little cul-de-sac. It's driving me absolutely crazy. And so I put an automatic light in the cul-de-sac and therefore whenever he moved in the cul-de-sac, it would turn on. And you'd hear him gasping and jumping out of the light and gasping and went on for a couple nights. And finally he burst when I was working in the little garden at the condo, he burst around the corner and went marching off down the street. And he was smoking, of course, the cigarette was in the center of his mouth. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, he doesn't even know how to smoke. And he grabs the cigarette out of his mouth instantly and, as if he heard my thought, which I'm sure he did. It turned out he's living, was living in a condo immediately behind ours with two other men, two men who were very creepy. And I called the owner of that condo. I got the owner of the condo's name from the management. And the man says to me, there's no one living in my condo. I said, yeah, there are three people at least, there were three. I think there are two people now living in your condo. And so I tell some of my neighbors this. Everyone in the condo complex becomes aware that these two weird men are squatters. And the next thing we know, the sheriff is given an eviction notice. And they walk around the condo trying to sell the guy's furniture. <laughs> like, like we wouldn't we would buy his furniture out from under him when we all knew that these people were squatters and they were very sinister people. Once I saw one of them in the nearby store, they all smoked all the time in the nearby, uh, drugstore. And this is what I saw him doing. He was in the drugstore in broad daylight, loading up, grocery bags and his arms with every kind of cigarettes. And in those days, those things were not, uh, they were, this is the like 1997. They were not, they were all out on shelves. They weren't locked away or anything. And reasonably and, priced. <laughs> right. And, and, and he was pipe, tobacco, cigars, cigarettes, everything he could put. He's just filling these shopping bags with them. And I thought to myself, I wonder how much money this guy has on him. And he walks out of the store, and as he walks past me, he gives me this sinister, amused, knowing look, like, you know perfectly well what's going on here, and I know you know it. And the clerks and the other people in the store, before my eyes, just stared straight ahead, and didn't do or say a thing. They didn't even know it happened. Wow. Isn't that astonishing? And these people 
<laughs> these people were not my enemies. They were just incredibly creepy. They were trying to guard me and protect me. Interesting. No one ever said this wouldn't be weird. Well, this this type of phenomenon is just rife with high strangeness. In fact, uh, <laughs> it's where my my research has gone in recent years. Uh, you know, I started off in this field almost twenty years ago, just as a, a ghost researcher, paranormal researcher. But I, you know, doing shows like this and speaking with people like yourself and all the other. Um, Learning about all these other different experiences out there, my whole paradigm has changed, and I look at the world as this more of a, the high strangeness factor of all these things that are going on all around us. And so it doesn't surprise me. And again, just because something may frighten you doesn't necessarily mean that it means you harm or is evil. Uh, again, even right, some absolutely. some of the experiences that you had early on uh, in the 80s, going in the 90s, terrified you, scared you to death. And yet you pushed yourself to move onward and something in you was telling you to go forward and not run from it, to, and which led you to developing that deeper relationship with the visitors. Yeah, I'm not going to run from it. Uh, I won't. I'm not going to. If they, if I'm eaten, then you'll know that I'm not here anymore and watch out. So, but I've been in all kinds of situations with them. And, you know, there's no evidence that they're going to harm me and they haven't harmed me so far. Uh, so, you know, going, I, I want to just, we have a few minutes left and I want to, Tie this in because one of your other earlier books, which I've always been fascinated with, and to think of how he might how he might relate to all of this is, you know, your book, The Key, and you talk about the master of the key, and that gentleman who appeared in your hotel room that night when you were on the book tour in Canada, and you spent forty five minutes listening to him and asking questions and talking to him about all of these different topics that were just very mind-blowing. And do you feel that possibly he might have been part of this breakaway situa uh, civilization, or if he was even human? Uh, I wish I could answer that. I'm... Um, if anything, he was part of the breakaway civilization, but it's also possible that, you know, you could see, I, I can certainly believe that there are people who look human, but who are not human and are maybe even born on other worlds, which are, which, in, which have human populations. We don't know where we came from. I, I do know this, that we are radically different from the other animals on this planet. We're clearly genetically related to the apes. But boy, I mean, you take the highest ape and place that ape behind, beside a human being. And you have to admit that there is a load of difference. Unimaginably huge a load of difference. So, you know, at least in part, we could be from somewhere else, I think. I don't see. I don't find that difficult to believe, or I don't reject it as ridiculous at all. Well, either from somewhere else, or we've been genetically manipulated by these other races that have come here, and we've been technically created uh, to be who we are. And there's the differences. You know, we have the differences in the different uh, uh, ethnic ethnicities um, across the planet, but yet. You're right. I've always found it weird on how we as humans don't look like any other creature on this planet. We have, like, you know, practically no hair compared to everybody else. The way our feet are, the way our legs are, the hands, the posable thumbs, and, and just something about it, about us, is just off compared to everything else on this planet. And yet we, you know, 
science again is more than happy to say, well, we, we evolved from the apes and became cavemen and Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon, and now here we are today as modern human. And, and it just, I don't think it's as simple as that. Um, especially when there's a lot of evidence that people in, and you've had this experience too, when genetic material is being taken from people. And it seems like there is in some aspects, yeah, some types of hybrid was taken from me. Yep. And some type of hybrid program going on. And what is it for? You know, we don't really know. I and mean, some people are horrified by it. And yet, at the same time, there it might be something that's just beyond our comprehension, something that is not necessarily evil or not necessarily good, but just is. Uh, that's, wh- uh, you know, I think what's happening is what we were just talking about, only it's not happening. It Maybe it happened in the past. I'm sure it, I'm, I would assume it did. Uh, the, the engineering of the species... And we're right in the middle of a period where this is happening right now. And this is what it looks like when it's happening to somebody who knows, that, that, who can tell that something's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, they are engineering us, re-engineering us right now. I'll tell you some of the ways they're doing it. And Annie figured this out in her lifetime. Oh, God, she, I miss her so. She was so brilliant. She's still brilliant, but boy... I would like to put my arms around that beautiful little old body <laughs> again. That's what I miss. In any case, uh, she said years ago, she said, you know, Whitley, when you have questions that you can't answer and that you can't ignore, it makes the mind, in, it raises the IQ, it raises the intelligence level. She said, that's what the visitors are doing. And if you look at intelligence testing over the years, the average IQ, at least in the developed world where there has been such testing and in places like, I believe, Sweden, when there's been a lot of that testing, is definitely rising. And this could be one of the reasons. She said the theater in the sky is there for us to look up and ask questions that we can't ignore and can't answer. And it literally increases the 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 efficiency of the brain it increases the number of cells in the brain devoted to intelligence and that is passed down genetically that's just one of the things that's being done i'm sure but i think we are in a situation right now where someone is actively altering us right now Altering us and changing us um, from generation to generation. I mean, this is this is all not something that's happening overnight. Although, no, pe- people they got plenty of time. There's going to be a new humanity here, and they we are seeing the beginnings of that humanity being created. It's going to be interesting. You, you, one way you say you wish you're around to see it, but then we'll probably be here <laughs> when it is happening. We'll, we'll be in new bodies, possibly, but uh, we will be experiencing it for ourselves. Um, yeah. You know, especially since they seem to be interacting with us on a soul level and after death, dealing with, we call it our dead, but it really it's just it's just our spirits and who, who we are and they help us recycling from one flesh flesh body of flesh to another to have these experiences and and continue to grow exactly and that is we are growing i mean we are look at the difference between us now and us 25 years ago this species is just in a we're in the middle of an incredible revolution of knowledge and also of individual access to information Everyone wails about how awful the internet is, but you go on Google and ask a question and you get an answer instantly that, and you grow from that. This is, this is a massive educational tool that we've invented for ourselves. And not only that, we've got somebody here who is working to increase our intelligence. So we'll be able to use the darn thing wisely, which is hard now because it's too new and we're too new in dealing with it. And, you know, it's easily, 
we're easily confused. But it, it's happening. This is all happening. I'm, I'm quite convinced of it. I think we're going to go through a hell of a time. I think that the environment is going to collapse around us. And the whole mindset that allowed that to happen is going to end up becoming an obsolete part of the human past. I, the, 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 the climate change denial is that is that, that entire level of mind that does things like that is going extinct. I agree. I agree. And um, that's going to be something. Yeah, it's going to take something that drastic to get us to to force part of that change. Um, now, f two things. First of all, uh, we have reached the end of the program. Um, so I wanted to thank you for coming on. But, but, but before we, we sign off here, and Irene, I'm going to ask you, is it okay for me to tell Whitley what you just wrote down? Or do you even remember it? Irene, are you there? She may not be fully here. Whitley, I'll tell you something. When you were talking about Anne a few minutes ago, uh, Irene has texted me a little bit during this program because, you know, she said she, she couldn't participate. She wrote down four words to me out of the blue. That was right after what you were saying about wanting to be with her. Yeah. It says, we will dance again. <laughs> we will dance again. Hello. I, I unfortunately danced like a pickup truck and <laughs> danced wonderfully. Oh, no, she didn't say she didn't say a pickup truck. She said you dance like a bus. <laughs> but, but, but she took she took me to dance lessons and I learned to dance pretty well. Wow, wow! I, I'm sitting here with goosebumps right now. That that I'm just chilled. That oh, that. Sorry about that, Whitley. You know, it's just that you wanted a hugger, and that's what happened. Ha! <laughs> oh, my girl. Thank you guys very much. Oh, sure. I'm um, sorry I couldn't participate. Uh, Mark will tell you the reason at some point. <laughs> yes. Well, we have come to the end of the show. Now, uh, Whitley's new book is called A New World. And, uh, Whitley, where can people uh, get a hold of that book? Easiest to do it on do it. Amazon. You can do it you on Amazon. Barnes and Noble and other places like that, too. Okay. And also, I uh, encourage people to visit Whitley's website, unknowncountry.com. And, of course, your own uh, podcast, weekly podcast you put out, Dreamland, uh, which is uh, another great show. So, Whitley, again, thank you very much for coming on tonight and talking with us. This has been an exceptionally enlightening experience. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Well, and I want to thank uh, everybody else for listening to another edition of uh, Paranormal UK Radio here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Uh, and we will catch you all next week. Um, Irene, uh, hope you feel better. And uh, we'll talk with everybody soon. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.